Okay. Okay, well, just to say um, welcome once again to the latest in the Centre for HPSTM uh, talk series. Um, we're delighted today uh, to welcome uh, Richard Anderson of this parish, University of Aberdeen. Um, Richard's currently a lecturer in the history of slavery, um, and for the first two years of his project, he's looking at the legacy of historic slavery to the University of Aberdeen, but also to the northeast of Scotland uh, more generally. I expect we may hear more about that later. Um, previously, he's uh, had a PhD at Yale. He's been a lecturer and postdoc at Exeter, Leicester and uh, York University. He's the author of many... <laughs> Sorry. He's the author of many important studies, including um, a monograph um, called Abolition in Sierra Leone, published uh, by Cambridge University Press uh, 2020, and an edited volume, Liberated Africans, published by Rochester, also in 2020. And I uh, welcome him today. I believe he's going to be talking about Nathaniel King, African graduates and medicine in West Africa. Over to you, Richard. Well, ben, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm going to attempt to share the screen. Um, I'll say from the outset that um, I'm not a historian of science, technology or medicine, um, but I will be speaking about Nathaniel King, who was uh, a prominent um, doctor in colonial West Africa. Um, and as far as we know, based on the University of Aberdeen's imperfect role of graduates, the first black African born graduate of the University of Aberdeen, who earned his MB in 1876. Um, he wasn't the first black student of the University of Aberdeen or the first to study medicine. That's the distinction that falls to Christopher James Davis of Barbados, who graduated in 1870. Um, but he is, as far as we know, the first black African born student of the university. Um, and when I came to the University of Aberdeen in, in, in September, um, I'd not heard of Nathaniel or his significance as Aberdeen's first black student or his role as a pioneering doctor in British colonial West Africa. Um, but I had um, coincidentally um, researched and written extensively on his father. Um, who was enslaved in West Africa, was liberated by the British Navy and became a missionary and linguist in Sierra Leone and later what would become Nigeria. So I really want to trace the path of Nathaniel King um, and his family from about the 1820s to 1880s and how he came to study medicine at Aberdeen um, and then situate his career within a broader context of the universities. Uh, a medical school as an imperial center in the latter half of the 19th century. So Nathaniel King's father was born in a town called Emory, um, which no longer exists. It was in what is today southwestern Nigeria. So if you see on the map here, uh, Lagos is on the coast. Emory was um, some some distance inland. Um, and his father, Thomas, was born into an era of rapid political change. Um, this gray area on the map represents what was known as the Oyo Empire. And at this time, it was collapsing, partly due to the pressures of a jihad movement from the north. Um, the village was destroyed about 1825. Thomas, whose birth name we don't know, was taken to Lagos placed on a slave ship bound for Havana. The vessel was captured by the British and was diverted to Freetown, Sierra Leone. And Thomas became a liberated African, one of approximately 100,000 people taken from slave ships after the passage of the Abolition Act and taken to Sierra Leone. We know a lot about Thomas's life because he wrote an account of his enslavement um, as a missionary for the Church Missionary Society. Um, this account was later published, as you can see here. Um, and so much of my own research has focused on this history of liberated Africans, and it's through that history that I came to Nathaniel King via his father. 
So after his arrival in Freetown, Thomas was subsequently educated by the Church Missionary Society. That is the Church of England mission within the colony. He became a Christian converse, catechist and so-called native pastor. Uh, and he participated in the Niger expedition, which was an ill-fated British mounted missionary expedition to the confluence of the, the Niger and Benue rivers. Um, this was cataclysmic in terms of loss of life, in terms of fever. Um, and when the expedition was withdrawn, Thomas returned to Sierra Leone. So it was in the years after the Niger expedition that Thomas and his wife Mary had five children. Um, Nathaniel, the, the university's first black African born graduate, was the second of five sons. And he was born in the village of Hastings, Sierra Leone on the 14th of July, 1847. So this is um, a, a postcard from about the turn of the 20th century uh, of what Hastings looked like. Um, this is one of the villages on the outskirts of Freetown that was established in the early 19th century, especially for the reception of, of liberated slaves. So in 1849, Thomas graduated from Foray Bay Institution, which was the main Center for Higher Education in West Africa. It was also a CMS institution. Uh, and for that same year, he departed for what became known as the Yoruba mission. So the CMS mission to what is now southwestern Nigeria. So the deadly failure of the Niger expedition did not dissuade Thomas from returning closer to his place of birth. And one outcome of the Niger expedition was the acknowledgement among missionaries and like minded abolitionists that the missionization of the interior of what was known as the Bight of Benin could only be led by African born mission agents. As you can see here, Samuel Crowther, who was a key part of the Niger expedition, says that very little can be done by European missionaries. I'm reluctantly led to adopt the opinion that Africa can cheaply be benefited by her own children. And the committee of the CMS really agreed and, and harnessed the sentiment that among liberated Africans, there is a strong and natural desire, desire to return to the countries from whence they were carried into slavery. So after the Niger expedition, many liberated African traders began returning to this area of, of, of present day southwestern Nigeria. And the mission followed first from the coast and then inland to Abiyakuta, which was a new settlement that was established in around 1829, 1830 in the aftermath of warfare in the region. And so Thomas King with his, his young family arrived at Abiyakuta in 1850. Um, by this time, Nathaniel King is about three years old. Um, at Abiyakuta, the, the family survives attacks from the Kingdom of Dahomey to the west. And it's here that uh, Thomas spends the rest of his life as, as a native pastor and was ordained in 1857. So Thomas King was a historical figure who I researched and written about at length, and it was only in coming to Aberdeen that I realized that Thomas had a son and that the sun holds a place of significance and accomplishment as university's first African born graduate. Um, he graduated with an MB in 1876 uh, and a half century later. Uh, this was actually a half century after his father disembarked from the slave ship. So. Nathaniel was raised and socialized in an intercolonial context, which linked Nigeria and Sierra Leone to the British metropole. And he spent his early years at the inland station at Abiyakuta. Um, but his life was really shaped by developments along the coast. Um, in 1851, the British bombarded Lagos uh, and deposed the King or Oba for one more amenable to British commerce and anti-slavery initiatives. And the bombardment opened up Lagos to missionaries and new European merchants. So the CMS then gravitated from 
at the Akuta to really focusing particularly on Lagos. Um, so the young Nathaniel first attended the CMS Theological Institute at Abbey Akuta and came to the attention of a CMS missionary doctor and Cambridge graduate A. A. Harrison, um, who had been sent to establish a medical school, um, the missions first in West Africa at Abbey Akuta. Um, Harrison chose four of the most promising students from the theological training institution, including Nathaniel King. Um, Nathaniel stands out and it seems that the three other chosen students all all ran away and had no interest in attending um, West Africa's first Western medical school. Um, but Nathaniel King stayed on and he spent mornings at, at the theological institution, followed by afternoons in which Harrison taught a range of topics from anatomy, anatomy to botany, zoology, chemistry and mathematics. Um, Nathaniel became Harrison's personal assistant, though the doctor died in 1865. Um, King returned to Sierra Leone at the age of 18, studied at the grammar school and worked for two years as a dispenser, as well as an apprentice in the colonial hospital. So in 1871, King left for England. He completed clinical studies at King's College uh, and then proceeded and graduated MB and CM in 1876 at Aberdeen. Um, and though he was the first black African born student at Aberdeen, he was one of an increasing number of colony born British subjects who traveled to Britain for education. Um, by mid-century, the, the offspring of educated and affluent liberated Africans, increasingly referred to as a Creole elite, were traveling to Britain to study medicine and law. Um, so Sylvester Cole, who was of another wealthy Creole family and born in Sierra Leone, earned his medical degree um, from Aberdeen in 1883 after four years of study. So listed here are, are the first three known um, black graduates of, of the University of Aberdeen from our role of graduates um, born in Barbados um, and then in Sierra Leone. Um, so Sylvester Cole's subsequent career saw him appointed a colonial surgeon on the Gold Coast in, in, in present day Ghana. Um, and John Hargreaves, who taught African history at University of Aberdeen for three decades, um, suggests that both Nathaniel King and Sylvester Cole may have chosen Aberdeen on the advice of Samuel Rowe, who was an Aberdeen medical graduate and colonial official served for 26 years in West Africa. Um, Rowe graduated at Aberdeen in 1865 in, in medicine and surgery and held a number of, of key posts in Sierra Leone, Cape Coast and Lagos. So in some ways it's not surprising that King and Cole came to study medicine, the merging of Kings and Marshall in 1860 to form the modern university was marked by the establishment of four new chairs, three in the medical disciplines. Um, the priority given to medicine was in turn influenced by the establishment of the General Medical Council in 1859. And as John Hargreaves observes, Aberdeen's reorganized medical school became an imperial center, training many doctors for overseas service and attracting increasing numbers of students domiciled abroad. Um, there were some barriers to King's attendance. Um, first was in terms of requirement for entry. Um, in King's case, this was fulfilled based on his previous work um, at King's College um, and also having worked as a dispenser um, and in the Colonial Hospital in Sierra Leone, as well as working uh, in London hospitals as part of his clinical studies. Um, a second barrier was was financial um, and in the sense uh, King benefited by having uh, an uncle who was himself a liberated African named Henry Robin who grew quite wealthy in the origins of cotton production and cotton export in 19th century West Africa. So unfortunately we know very little of Nathaniel's time and experiences in Aberdeen, and that's probably the area for future research, what he made of his studies, what he made of 
northeastern Scotland, whether it be in terms of the weather or in terms of being uh, a black African in northeastern Scotland in the 1870s. Um, what we do know is that the attendance of Nathaniel King and Cole wasn't a watershed moment in the history of the university. Um, in his graduating class of 1876, King was outnumbered by white South African graduates eight to one. And for 50 years after King and Cole, no black students graduated from Aberdeen. Um, so these are figures that uh, are from a work that John Hargreaves published 25 years ago for the 500th anniversary, um, looking at overseas students in the period 1860 to 1900. Um, so the vast majority studied medicine. All of these individuals were male. Um, and in total, about 11% of medical graduates in this period were overseas born. Um, but if we break this down by, by birthplace, we see that King was rel of a relatively small number of what Hargreaves grouped as being from other birthplaces. Um, many of those here that were born in India, Burma, Ceylon were the sons of Scots, often Aberdeen graduates whose fathers were soldiers, doctors, missionaries within Britain's Asian empire. Um, so relatively few were colonial subjects of, of non of non British descent. Um, and I'd mentioned earlier that um, King was the first black African born graduate of the University of Aberdeen because in fact the first African born graduate of the university uh, appears to be a man named Francois Fropier who was a French Creole born on the island of, of Mauritius uh, and graduated in 1860, uh, 1863 uh, with an MD. Um, he's someone that I haven't been able to find much information on, um, but he seems to be of, of a quite prominent family um, in Mauritius, and there might be some connections there with the history of slavery and the slave trade in Mauritius in the 19th century. So if we place King within a broader context of overseas students studying medicine from 1860 to the turn of the 20th century, he is part of a larger movement of medical students from across the empire. And certainly the medical school was an imperial hub, but those that attended from overseas were most often British expatriates and the children of uh, British citizens abroad. So Nathaniel was really quite exceptional as a West African born medical student whose both parents had been enslaved. So this is the only known photo of Nathaniel King. Um, he's posed very confidently at, at the front um, here in front of what was known as the Wilberforce Oak or Emancipation Oak in Kent. Um, this is supposedly where in the 1790s, William Wilberforce and Pitt discussed their campaign for the abolition of the slave trade. Um, he is alongside other members of, of the Church Missionary Society, um, all of whom are quite significant in the history of, of West Africa and Nigeria in particular. So this is taken just as um, King is proceeding to Aberdeen for his studies. And so three years later, uh, King returned to Lagos. Um, by this time, when he returns in 1876, um, British colonial occupation over 15 years had transformed what was an independent kingdom into a cosmopolitan commercial entrepot. King served as a medical attendant to, um, to the agent of the Church Missionary Society at Lagos and occasionally acted as locum at the colonial hospital. King was later offered a more lucrative position as assistant colonial surgeon at Accra in present day Ghana um, for 400 pounds a year, but he refused the offer because he wanted to remain in Lagos. So in Lagos, many European residents preferred King's professional services over those of the colonial surgeon. He developed a reputation for his willingness to treat African patients who could not afford to pay his fees. The Eagle and Lagos Critic, an early African-owned newspaper, praised his boundless charity on, on, unhonestaciously rendered to many in this land. 
Beyond his profession, Nathaniel was a conspicuous member of the educated Lagosian elite. Newspaper commentators praised how socially Marble Hall, the location of his offices on Broad Street, was only open to all those who sought him for advice and help, and that his house was a virtual literary club. Nathaniel was also a senior deacon of a Masonic lodge, and he presided at the public examination of students at the CMS Grammar School. He joined with other prominent Lagos residents in petitioning the British government for improved public drainage and sanitation, assistance to vernacular schools, and representation within the Legislative Council. He also served on the board, uh, uh, editorial board of the Lagos Observer, one of the first African-owned newspapers in the colony. So in Nathaniel, we see some of the complexities of identity um, of educated, liberated Africans and their descendants as colonial subjects. One of his friends declared that he belonged to no tribe. He was an African. Um, and in a fascinating commentary on Western educated views on indigenous medicine, religion, and culture, the Eagle and Lagos critic described King as the first who, at much personal sacrifice, broke through and exposed the system of Babalawism to which the poor natives had been subjected, subjected and brought them to the knowledge and appreciation of European mode of treatment. So this disparaging mark on remark on Babalawism was a reference to the Yoruba Babalawo, which literally translates as father of secrets. Um, Babalawo is a diviner and healer who possesses knowledge of medicine and who are widely consulted to unlock the causes of illness and to prescribe the needed treatments. So within pre-colonial Yoruba society, healing was regarded primarily as a gift from the Supreme Being, Oladumare, and the Yoruba held that traditional healers possess, possess knowledge of healing from the Supreme Being. Thus, the employment of the Baobalawa in divination in the process of determining the cause and cure of illness was paramount. So this newspaper article stated that as a Western educated medical doctor, Nathaniel was the first to take on the, and challenge the Baobalawa. Um, this is really quite far from the truth. Um, he was not the first mission educated African to attempt to expose traditional Yoruba diviners and healers. Um, Nathaniel's efforts were part of a concerted effort over several decades, led not least by Nathaniel's father, Thomas. Um, and in a previous version of this talk, I presented at Black History Month, I was asked why Nathaniel might have gravitated towards medicine as a profession in the first place. Um, I don't really have an answer, but since October, I've I've looked through particularly his father's journals, which every um, CMS agent in the field kept and which are now held at the CMS archives in Birmingham. Um, and you can see that much of his father's work on a day to day basis was involved in healing. Um, and this is a journal entry from June 1861, where he talks about one of his communicants falling ill due to a miscarriage. And as you can see, Nathaniel's father says, were she left to the entire management of her heathen relatives and husband, she would have by all means died as their chiefest anxieties and endeavors would be nothing else than consulting and sacrificing to Aoife, uh, etc. So Aoife is the form uh, of divination conducted by the Babalawo. And as you can see here, he, he made the Babalawo and all of others um, stand to the side um, until a fair trial of those brought by uh, the Christians could be made. Um, and so this interaction ends with him having a conversation with those present, uh, and he says among whom was a, ba a Babalawo or Ifa priest, and the Babalawo basically tries to make the point that Essentially, their roles are similar as healers. Um, 
But Thomas King responds that by saying, of this I endeavoured to convince him that their motions and doctrines are diametrically opposite to ours, and as much as they predict health and prosperity to those who are capable of making costly sacrifices to ward or avert off any calamity and misfortune, while on the contrary, God commands us to warn people to prepare for death and judgment by speedy repentance. So, I think then that the significance of um, this extract is, of course, we can see the missionary as a somewhat paternalistic dispenser of Western medicines, um, but it's also significant, I think, that Thomas and his father in their professions as native pastor, and then his son as a medical doctor could view the Yoruba Babalawo as a potential rival whose role as healer and diviner was antithetical to their own. So Nathaniel King died quite young at the age of 36 um, when a smallpox epidemic spread through Lagos in 1884. During his short career, he became a leading Lagosian citizen and impacted the history of the colonial port that has since grown into Africa's largest city. Um, charting his life after Aberdeen, the, his obituary in the Lagos Observer recalled how Nathaniel returned to Lagos in 1876, and from that time his life was on one course of usefulness. Dr. King gradually gained the confidence of the community till his name became a household world. As a medical man, the poor and rich were at all times accessible to him. Poverty never influenced him in his zeal for the sick. To save life is a medical man's first consideration, and his remuneration the second was a favorite expression of his. And this spirit actuated him throughout all his noble career. So after his death, um, his friends proposed a, a memorial. Um, this was quite novel in the history of, of West Africa to memorialize people through physical forms. Um, and they opted for the erection of a stained glass window and plaque uh, in Christ Church in the Fadji district of Lagos. Uh, and we can see here the inscription at the bottom of, of this newspaper article. Um, and what's interesting is that one of his colleagues, the Reverend James Johnson, picked up on this by visiting England in the 1870s. Um, and there's resonances today where he noticed the number of statues to great men in Victorian England, and he felt that Africa would not achieve greatness um, unless West Africa did the same. Um, and he says here that England is unwilling to forget the great men who have helped to make her great. Um, and so there was a campaign for a memorial to King in this church in Lagos. Now, unfortunately, the memorial did not last long. Um, a white archdeacon almost immediately had the plaque removed. This was ostensibly on the ground that he did not like the phrasing of Dr. King MD, um, which he, he felt was redundant, um, but was probably actually more broadly reflective of uh, a changing racial climate within, within late uh, Victorian Lagos, especially in the context of, of the rise of, of scientific racist thinking. Um, it's a time of increasing tension between educated Africans um, and white missionaries and colonial officials um, at a time when an increasing number of Europeans are traveling to West Africa due to advances in tropical medicine and, and pushing many of the educated Africans out of the colonial bureaucracy and positions of influence in the mission. Um, the church in which the window was erected also no longer exists, having been struck by lightning uh, and incurring structural damage in 1937. Um, and it also seems that the cemetery uh, in which King was buried a jelly, which was the main colonial cemetery um, for prominent Lagosians, was knocked down and completely flattened by the military government of, of Nigeria in the 1970s. Um, so in some ways, it's, it's a quite sad conclusion that there appears to be 
no extant memorial within Lagos to the University of Aberdeen's first um, African born student, even though um, there was a, an effort within his lifetime that he be acknowledged by his peers. Um, And so in some ways it's a sad coda, but rather than focus on the loss of these memorials to King, I'd really rather emphasize how in 1885 King's peers came together to erect a memorial in his honor. Um, so just to give a brief conclusion, this is part of a larger paper where I talk a lot more about what Nathaniel's life tells us about abolition and empire, the relationship between homeland and diaspora, complexities of identity and belonging for colonial subjects in British West Africa in terms of race, class and religion. Um, what it meant when Nathaniel King was described as an African who belonged to no tribe. Um, and of course, how this fits within recent efforts within Scotland to look at the linkages with slavery and empire. Um, and it fits within that insofar as much of that work has been focusing on Glasgow as, as a city of empire and also Edinburgh in terms of the 19th century empire as a locus for imperial subjects studying medicine in particular. But I think there is a need especially to extend that discussion to Aberdeen. Um, the story of Nathaniel King extends the history of Aberdeen to Sierra Leone and Nigeria. King spent two years in Scotland uh, as, as the university's first African born student um, and his first and as the first graduate, he may have been directed here by Sir Samuel Rowe, himself an Aberdeen graduate and one of the first graduates of the university to enter colonial service. And along with Sylvester Cole, he was part of an increasing number of colonial born British subjects who traveled to Britain for education during the late Victorian period. And yet King and Cole were the last black graduates of the university for 55 years until the Jamaican born Henry Daniel Chambers graduated in 1938. So in light of efforts to mark the institution's 525th anniversary by looking at alumni achievement stories like Nathaniel King can illuminate important discussions ranging from representation and access in British higher education to the legacies of empire in Scotland. I'll leave it there. <laughs>